Hi, good morning everyone. Well, it's morning here anyways. Welcome to another episode of Monroe Live. Today we're gonna to be looking at the underbody. Um, so we've got on the hoist today of a Nissan Aria. So with me today is Julian Eights. Julian's one of our lead engineers that does a lot of our high voltage battery teardowns, thermal management systems. So with this up on the hoist, although we've got some aero shields um, kind of obscuring what we're going to be able to see uh, on film today, we'll, we'll talk to what is visible some of the decisions that they made to uh, cover up that battery pack. Right. And then also on the front end of the vehicle from an architectural perspective, we'll kind of walk you through some of the things that we're seeing, perhaps some of the rationale as to why um, Nissan made the decisions that they did. Um, and we'll kind of ste step through a few technical elements. Mm -hmm. So um, if I didn't say Jordan Orocho with Monroe and Associates, um, I, I did want to mention also, and we, we typically are, are, you know, doing videos like this and, and you see a lot of content come out from Monroe. But if you didn't know, what Monroe really and truly does in terms of, you know, what we actually do for work, it's we don't just look at these and do, you know, general qualitative reviews. But in fact, we're really looking for what that OEM did, how they decided to do what they did, um, you know, some of the architectural decisions they made. And really what we're looking for is, you know, manufacturing, costs, weight, um, supply chain robustness, right? All these different uh, variables that an OEM's gotta go through in the decision-making process. We're trying to back into what's the most efficient way to do it, um, how do we get to another level of integration? And so we're always curious to see, like with Nissan, what they you know, deployed on this particular vehicle to reduce costs, improve manufacturability, and so forth. So we'll try and step you through some of those items as we go through the underbody here. So we'll start from the front to the back, and I'll hand over to Julian as soon as we kind of get towards the battery area. But if we, if we start at the front of this vehicle, uh, first things first, we're not seeing any uh, major A-surface AGS. The AGS stands for active grill shutters, whereby you've got some louvers or some covers on the front of the vehicle that are active, meaning they've got some motors and actuators. And, and a lot of folks are now starting to do that in the BEV space from an uh, aer aerodynamic performance. So getting those drag counts down, really maximizing the range with a given kilowatt hour um, size of battery, right, to overall, reduce costs, improve MVH, et cetera. The Aria, interestingly enough, did not uh, execute a AGS system on the A surface, which a lot of folks are doing. And the range is actually, you know, stating that there's not a lot on this vehicle, whether, you know, battery size or some of those aero characteristics, um, they're, they're not getting a huge amount of range, right? They're not actually even to that 300 mile uh, range target, which is kind of, these days, right? It seems to be the, the barrier to entry for most BEV. So um, I, it's interesting to me that they, they did not get there and um, they didn't make some decisions like that from a range perspective. Now, moving back, you know, some of the first things that caught our eyes when looking underneath this, some of the aero shields is these guys right here. So these are often referred to as um, spats or you know kind of these wheel envelope uh, guides or deflectors that really what what these guys are here for is to as a, as the slipstream comes to the vehicle this lip and this ramp on this feature help shoot that air around the wheel envelope right such that the air can go under body and as that air stream comes back up it'll hit the aero shields back here really what you're trying to avoid is air getting into this wheel envelope because that has kind of a, a suction or a vortex effect, which is really ultimately gonna increase drag. Now, if you notice, when I push on this, it is absolutely a uh, elastomeric, right? It, it's, a, it's a very compliant material. And the rationale behind that is because if you pull up to a curb, you know, the, the age old curb rash, and you hit this, that's not gonna fracture and blow this part apart. Rather, it's gonna, it's gonna compress or compromise, and then it's gonna spring back. But they didn't do what we've seen some other OEMs do, namely BMW, where they're integrating this into a shield adjacent to it, right? So from, from an integration perspective, reduction of fasteners, that manufacturability piece, they're not doing a lot of integration. And I think what you'll see as we get to the battery pack is for the aero shields overall, they're not doing a lot in the way of integration. 
Moving a little bit further rearward, and, and Grace, if you were to kind of spin around and look in this area of the vehicle, you'll see that one, they've got a, a lower cross member. This is not their primary bumper beam, but rather a lower member um, that does go through body. You can see it's that E-coat um, type paint, right? It's not the body color, but it is E-coated, so it is going through the paint shop. And then you see this little um, fore aft section right here going to it, but it doesn't make full contact with that beam. And so this beam coupled with this white polystyrene, which is typically an expanded polypropylene, that sort of gray uh, material right here, this, this whole section in these monuments are from an energy absorption perspective. They're going to do two things on this vehicle, if I had to venture a guess. One, this monument right here, this section, and this reinforcement are going to help from a SORB perspective. So that's small overlap rigid barrier, whereby 25% of the vehicle is going to engage with the barrier. This monument right here, as you can see, it ties directly into the cradle, which is this black stamp steel weldment coupled with the air gap and this reinforcement, they're gonna start transferring load during that impact event to the front cradle. What that's gonna enable is it's gonna reduce the amount of energy that the body in white needs to manage during that impact event. Um, so so they're, they're trying to attack that energy from multiple locations in Z, right? And the vertical axis. So they've got a lower monument, They've got an upper monument and presumably they're tying into their shock tower above, you know, in their, their shotgun assembly as well, which we can't see from under here too well, um, but presumably that's what they're doing. The other thing that they're likely doing with this member is this is going to be a PED Pro enabler. So pedestrian protection, um, especially in Europe, right, there's a uh, major requirement for these vehicles to have a very planar and flat front end. Um, and so having monuments in the lower end of this fascia so that you don't get like this structurally very like narrow front end of the vehicle um, they're likely using this for that as well um, and then obviously they are tying in laterally um, the two monuments at the front of the vehicle with these which is interesting because they have a cradle member just aft of it so they've got this piece right here and then just aft of that they have a cradle cross member they're likely doing that to stiffen this whole front end, once again, from a sword perspective. If these monuments start to collapse, meaning the left and the right sections of the vehicle in the sorb event start to get closer to one another, ultimately what happens is, is that barrier gets closer and closer to the occupant home. Um, you're, you're not diverting energy through the longitudinal section of that and getting that linear energy absorption but rather those are just kind of compromising and deflecting off to the side. So likely they're adding this, seems to be a late add if I'm being frank, meaning it, I don't know that this was originally intended to be in the vehicle. Um, and, and they're using that to help stiffen this whole area in addition to the cooling module support above. Moving rearward, other than that, in terms of the suspension architecture, it's relatively straightforward and conventional. It's a stamped steel, full perimeter cradle, meaning they do have a cross member fore, aft, left, and right, so full perimeter cradle, the subframe here. Um, it's a stamped steel weldment. It's decked in Z exclusively. They do a six point, actually, uh, they may do, yeah, no, it is a six point mount. These are stabilizer bar links. They've got an isolated mount right here. And then they actually transfer to hard mounts as they go aft. So they've got, it looks to be an isolated front end. Obviously we haven't de-decked the whole uh, assembly, but they have an isolated front end, but then they have a hard mounted rear, which is an interesting choice. There's reasons behind that um, or reasons why you would do that. Not super clear in this application why they did it. Um, but as you move rearward, the, the suspension architecture on the corners, so we've got a relatively conventional McPherson strut system, so coilover shock assembly or strut assembly above, tying into what looks to be uh, maybe a low pressure die casting um, from both the lower control arm and the knuckle perspectives. Um, the, the only thing I would say that we found interesting on all these knuckle assemblies, and Grace, if you swing around here, so I've got one wheel speed sensor here, right? So that's reading a ring within the, the wheel bearing and the hub assembly. And then I've got another sensor, which is gonna be difficult to pick up on camera, that looks to be doing the exact same thing. 
And you might ask, well, why in the world would you have two wheel speed sensors? One of the only things that comes to mind right now is a mechanically redundant system, meaning you've got, um, or I'll say a physical part, not mechanical per se, but a physical part redundancy. And that's going to be for, you know, these, uh, I believe this one's called the Pro Pilot 2.0, I think is their autonomous drive system. And so as we get to higher and higher levels of autonomy, not only do you need electrical redundancy, but you, in some instances, also need a physical part redundancy. So the wheel speed sensors, having two of them versus one, one, it's very atypical, um, but two, they do it on all four corners. So they do it on the two front and the two rear. So that may be from a redundancy perspective. Yeah. So kind of just an interesting note here. The last two notes before we get into the battery pack are one, this harness. So this harness right here, if you were to trace it outboard and go to um, the sill sections of the vehicle, you'll see that these harnesses are actually provisional for these lights and you know, sort of these uh, presentation lights. As you walk up to the vehicle, this whole thing right here, this is an LED strip. And so that is going to illuminate the ground, um, kind of that whole uh, side of vehicle space on the ground so that you can see what you're getting walking up to kind of gives you that premium appeal like your car is warming up to you as you walk up to it but that's not necessarily the interesting part that's kind of I don't know it's a creature feature it's a bell or a whistle however you want to state it but the fact that they're doing this with the harness is incredibly odd and you might say okay so what they just kind of use this bracket to wrap around it well it looks like it's kind of a boat mooring right where you're, you're looping the the rope around the dock but the fact that they've got so much extra harness and they've got all of these zip ties around it it, it you, you almost never see something like this unless it's an accessory package like i know on a ford raptor right you'll have the loop for all the accessories and they will deliberately give the customer extra extra space or extra length in order to attach various features, lights, winches, things along those lines. That's not the case here. So either it's a dealer installed item, could be, right, these lights, and so they're trying to wrap around here, and or it may very well be that this is a, a manufacturing or a decking assembly driven item, meaning the cradle might get decked, then they bring the harness in and then they wrap it around. Either way, just kind of an odd thing. And the last thing before we head over to the battery pack, are these double shear brackets. So these double shear brackets, we call them double shear because it's reinforcing the attachment of the cradle to the body structure on two separate planes. So one structural connection is at the top of the cradle where it interfaces with the body, which is gonna be hard to see, but it's right above where kind of the, the laser is showing right now. That's one structural um, plane. And then the other structural plane enabled by this stamped bracket is uh, going to be right here at the bottom of the cradle and so it really stabilizes and stiffens that whole joint in addition to the fact that this may be very well part of their impact script to help guide and manipulate that cradle dynamically as mm -hmm. as all those impact elements take place so i've certainly said enough about the front end of this vehicle julian you know, obviously we've got a lot of aero shields underneath here. Mm -hmm. Why don't you step us through what you're seeing as far as the battery pack, the aero shields, and all these connections are concerned? Right. So, uh, sort of to piggyback off of uh, where Jordan uh, left us, you know, um, so starting with those double shear brackets, that's kind of how we start to tie in the battery pack into the overall vehicle structure. Uh, this is an 87 kilowatt hour battery pack, uh, usable, 91 kilowatt hours total. This is the larger of the two battery packs that are offered for the Nissan Aria. Uh, the lower uh, level pack would be, uh, I believe, a 66 kilowatt hour total or 63 kilowatt hour usable. So this is uh, the bigger one that we're looking at. And from the underbody, one thing that immediately sticks out in contrast to almost any other BEV that we've taken a look at up on a hoist or done a teardown on is just the number of the aero shields that are protecting uh, this pack. Uh, typically, we'll see that we have the skid plates or aero shields fore and aft of the pack to cover the front and rear uh, drive units, which we've already removed. Uh, and then here, if we're just taking a look around, just moving around the perimeter, we've got one, two, three, four and then a fifth uh, aero shield uh, sort of in the center here 
uh, where typically we would either have just the bottom of the battery pack exposed or, uh, and we'll touch on you know, uh, why this was done uh, a little bit later, but uh, in the uh, you know, event that the battery pack has a more exposed or integrated thermal management system into the base plate, we will see uh, some additional uh, sort of air gap provided by a protective plate placed on the underbody, but even with that, we typically have not seen uh, them done in uh, any more than one component that would sort of encompass the entire underside of the pack. Um, so it's from this perspective, it is still, like we saw on the front end, lots of individual pieces, um, not super integrated. However, once we go above these aero shields, which we won't be able to do for this hoist review, However, we do have a, a really nice document that was actually published by Nissan, uh, which I will provide uh, to Grace so that we can have some images pop up to sort of contextualize what we're speaking to. But if you go above these uh, aero shields, uh, the design philosophy is almost entirely different. Uh, if we're gonna talk about things from an integration perspective, the battery pack almost seems like it was designed uh, with an entirely different mindset. Um, what we have is essentially uh, the base plate for that battery pack, like we saw with the Volkswagen ID4 and also the Kia EV6 and Hyundai uh, Ionic 5, has an integrated cold plate. However, uh, whereas those were large stamped and brazed assemblies that uh, formed the base of this, they're actually using aluminum extrusions for that. So in the extrusion profile, they're able to capture both the structural elements of what they want the bottom of the battery pack to be, as well as all of the channels that they're using to route the coolant, which is gonna come in on this side through a main coolant port, run all the way down this uh, left-hand side of the battery pack, loop back around, and then head up back out toward the front to then uh, run through the rest of the thermal management system like the low temperature radiator to be cooled, uh, or there's also a PTC heater integrated with this in order to heat the battery for cold weather conditions. Uh, so within those extrusion cells, even going to the outboard sides where we made against the pinch weld for the body, we see that there is a, you know, a very high level of integration with this, uh, which is uh, supported by some of the images that we'll have provided. Uh, they are capturing both uh, spaces for the brake lines running fore and aft uh, in the you know, part of the uh, cell in the extrusion on the outboard sides of the pack, as well as uh, where we have with many other packs such as the uh, 4680 Model Y pack, for instance. When that pack was dropped along the side sill, we actually were carrying uh, coolant lines external to the pack that were not for thermal management of the pack, but actually delivering glycol to the rear drive unit where we had the oil glycol heat exchanger. In this, rather than using a separate component, which is that uh, nylon uh, coolant line, we're actually using part of the profile of these extrusions to carry that coolant out to uh, the, uh, the rear drive unit. So uh, rather than having a separate component, they're just carrying it in an existing structure, which is, again, exactly the kind of thing that we want to see and that we've actually suggested to clients through various workshops uh, for cost optimization, uh, as well as just overall part reduction. It's a really elegant way to do it uh, because you have very limited space in this area. Um, and no matter what, for a side pole or whatever structure you're gonna have there, you do have to run the coolant fore aft anyway. Uh, and if anything, that allows you to, rather than have the coolant line be in between where you have your rocker section and then the structure on the side cell of the battery, you can integrate it and even probably, I would uh, you know, wager, I guess that you could garner more structure that way by being able to build your structure around uh, that, that coolant line there. So in terms of the overall pack construction, uh, I know we can't see it. I was really hoping that we'd be able to have some of the aero shields off for this, but there are quite a few components here. Uh, and uh, you know, just with the time constraints, it wasn't very feasible, but um, the, the pack itself does have some really uh, novel ideas in it and things that I think from an overall integration perspective, you know, we see lots of packs use extrusions. Uh, you know, we've seen Mach-E, Lightning, uh, EV6, Ionic 5, Lots of packs use extrusions for their body or for the overall structure. Uh, this is the first time we've seen it leveraged to capture more than just physical structure in those extrusion profiles, but rather using those uh, for a functional purpose as well in terms of deliver delivering glycol both to the uh, battery modules on the inside as well as uh, to the drive units at the rear of the vehicle. So uh, from a design perspective, I do really think that there are a lot of great ideas inside this pack. Uh, it just is covered up by 
something that is uh, seemingly clashing with that design philosophy in terms of you know many many fasteners and individual components to uh, protect that so yeah, I, I think for me, when I'm looking at the underside of the battery pack, you know, Julian, as you kind of articulated, like the whole thermal man management strategy, I, it, it's kind of a paradigm shift, at least from a, a perspective of how you look at thermal management. You know, most folks try and close everything out that they possibly can, but the Swiss cheese effect that we're getting right. here, you know, they're, they're leveraging kind of that Venturi effect, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's interesting to me that this is a production iteration and they made it work without having any sort of negative NVH side effects, meaning a whistle or right, right that kind of whoosh that you get um, from different things. But you know they've essentially got large, very planar flutes down here. You know, but somehow they managed to do it without getting any of those negative effects. You know, and as we look upstream of this, they're they're doing some other things that also speak to the fact that they're very very concerned or focused on this whole concept of leveraging airflow and letting you know ambient air out, right? You wanna get that stagnant air out, fresh air in. These, these ducts and or protectors right here are twofold. So if you look at these monuments right now, they are protecting some of the thermal management lines that go, you know, that run underneath and into the pack over here. But they did leave an orifice open, right? A void on the underside that that actually goes up to and points towards that whole EDM or drive unit section. And so one, one thing that you don't necessarily always think about or doesn't register is when you've got a big radiator and or condenser, a cooling module up front here, you're passing air over that and you're exchanging and you're getting a temperature drop from you know, either the refrigerant and or the ethylene glycol, depending on the heat exchanger type. But after that, right, because those are meant to cool, right so you're 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 using these to cool down whatever liquid or gas gaseous medium it need that air has got to go somewhere aft of that right and oftentimes it ends up here well when it ends up here around the edm and all these components you also need a way to extract it so it could be right it's it's hard to say without having all the cfd information but it could be that they're using these ducts to help provide some actual suction right via the open ended on the bottom you know the open end on the bottom here via venturi effect right they could actually be providing some suction or a way for that air to escape and and go underneath the vehicle and out of this this area right if hot air gets trapped here it's not good for well most things that live in this area of the vehicle so kind of an interesting little feature there i mean it obviously doubles as a protector from a stone impingement perspective of those thermal management lines yeah, maybe we can head to the back and take a look. So from a, a suspension architecture perspective, again, very conventional. As we see with most BEVs, the rear uh, suspension and cradle system is isolated. Um, the version of the vehicle that we have is front wheel drive only. And so you're not seeing the half shafts, although um, you, know, you are seeing provisions for isolators for drive units in the cradle. Um, spots to mount them. You are seeing voids right here, right? So they, they do have presumably package space to run those half shafts through. And then also you're seeing on the back side of the knuckle, right, where that half shaft would package um, and go through. But obviously the version of the vehicle that we have is just front wheel drive only. Um, they, you know, as we talk about integration, you know, one of the things that catches my eyes back here, again, with these lights, and this harness and some of these NVH pads here, right? These, or BSR, you know, buzz squeak rattle foam patches. They're going through a lot of effort to get these lights into place. You know, and the fact that they've got these bolt-on brackets that are cantilevered over, yes, it's nice that they're, they're kind of getting two functions for one, right? So they're using these fasteners to help support aero shields so on and so forth and they're using the brackets to help with that as well but right next to it right less than 100 millimeters away we have another shield and so if we were to change the material of that shield go to injection molded for example it's very possible that we could just snap these lights in or mold a portion of the housing for this light in versus having separate stamping separate fasteners separate processing separate assembly so those are the things that we're really trying to look at so 
Um, but, you know, in looking at the full picture, and I'd have to look at the building price, these lights could be optional. If these are optional, maybe they're like, their strategy is, you know what, um, we'll just give you brackets when we get lights. Right, a lot of OEM, you gotta make these decisions. It's not just one vehicle and one vehicle only. They're trying to consider the whole product lineup, right? And what is standard, what's optional, right? They're going through all these decision matrices to try and make decisions like that. So, but all in all, you know, the overall rear end of the vehicle is very conventional. Most of the links, except for one upper toe link, um, are stamped steel, right? And this upper toe link's an aluminum member the knuckles aluminum, but other than that, very conventional. Julian, are you seeing anything um, unique in the backside of the battery pack or anything that's visible here? Uh, in terms of the backside of the battery, uh, the only thing yeah. that's immediately sticking out is the location of the uh, PTC heater, which we can see here. Uh, so that's gonna be used for heating the uh, battery uh, coolant. So where it's difficult to see is where those coolant ports are coming out of the battery pack. Uh, but that in a cold weather condition, if you need to bring those battery temperatures up, it'll heat the coolant uh, before sending it back through the, uh, the circuit. That's a fairly conventional uh, approach that we've seen. Um, on the backside, other than that, there's uh, the high voltage connector here, uh, which it's not straightforward as to where that goes, but just immediately looking at this, it looks like the PTC power is being supplied directly out of that. Um, uh, that port from the battery pack. If that's the case, um, that's a fairly elegant way to do it. Uh, you know, normally um, there would be a separate high voltage cable run out of, uh, you know, a DC-DC converter, um, similar to what would be powering your EAC compressor uh, for the thermal management system. Um, so that allows a fairly short run and it's just a direct integration. Um, the high voltage cabling can be expensive. So uh, the less of that that you need, uh, definitely, you know, you're gonna be able to garner some, uh, some cost benefits there. So. Right. Yeah, the, the only thing that I was looking at from a structure's perspective in connection to the battery pack is, is once again with the double shear brackets. So these stampings right here um, with this, this bolt right there, those are, those are making a structural connection to the battery pack. And so one of the things that happens in a passenger car like this, right? So this is a two row kind of, you know, CUV, SUV crossover style size vehicle, just like a Model Y um, type of vehicle in terms of its size. When you get to this area of the vehicle fore aft, you've got a second row seat and that second row seat, the pan has a kick up often. Right, but your battery wants to run as far as you can possibly manage fore aft in order to contain the maximum amount of energy, battery, and so forth. But what happens is, is when that seat goes up, you often lose your structural continuity and or perches for this battery pack to then mount to. And so by leveraging the cradle, right, with these double shear brackets, what's happening is both the cradle might benefit as well as the battery pack. So those brackets, by tying those two things together, Structurally, you get a more monolithic approach, and so those double shear brackets are going to stiffen that joint um, at the cradle, and then they're also going to likely provide some stiffness to the battery pack. So kind of an interesting decision. It's definitely not the first time we've seen it. Uh, a lot of OEMs, specifically in this sort of crossover BEV space, Model Y size vehicles, uh, a lot of folks are doing this, so this is not atypical, um, but it is one of the things that the ARIA chose to do. So with that being said, um, thank you for, for joining us in the review for the ARIA. We appreciate it. If you've got any further inquiries or questions, well, hopefully we get to tear this vehicle down one day. Um, but please reach out to us at sales at leandesign.com and hopefully we'll catch you on the next video. Thank you so much.